Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we will be reconvening with Jonathan Jans for part two of our conversation. If you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to episode 227. In that conversation, we speak with Jonathan about gravitating towards do, dealing with rejection, and permission to suck. This is a three-part conversation, so, I mean, if you like that, and you like this one, and you want to get the third and final part ahead of the crowd, all you need to do is become our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror for the final part, or indeed at $4 to listen to all of it in one go. Before we get Jonathan back on the podcast, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Get ready to indulge in an audio experience that will make your skin crawl and your stomach churn. Sadistic experiments are being carried out in Arlington Asylum, designed to remake our world as a demonic Lovecraftian hellscape. Tormented, from horror author Lee Mountford and narrator Hannibal Hills, is now available as a high-quality audiobook. Search Tormented on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a Stephen King podcast. Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. All right, and we're back. And with that said, let us not delay. Here it is. It is Jonathan Jans on This Is Horror. And now for a horror interview. You were talking about the fear that you had when you were, like, growing up. You were scared of a lot of different things, which is understandable given, you know, where you were living and what was surrounding you. And then you were also talking now about how it's important not to fear too much. And we were talking about having some control over fear I'm wondering, was there a pivotal moment or was there anything that happened when this kind of mindset and this shift took place? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I do think the the moment with with Dallas Mayor, with Jack Ketchum was instrumental in getting me to just change. Well, I guess just to be more aware of fear's role in my life. And, and then that made me aware of how damaging it had been and how limiting it had been. And another example, this is this is going to sound so weird and superficial and odd, but, you know, that's how life is, right? These things come from areas we never expect. I, I'm i not like an insane sports fan, like, like I despise people from other <laughs> franchises or whatever. But I do like baseball. My, my son and I play baseball together. Uh, it's like something we share. And I'm a Cubs fan, which means I've felt a lot of pain over the years. And another example of how this, this Ketchum-esque um, approach to fear, I, I guess, um, insinuated itself into my life. In 2016, the Cubs were finally good. All right, I've been watching the Cubs get whipped my entire life. You know, I've seen them on the doorstep of success, only to just to just be shoved off the porch and break their necks. Right? It's it's awful to be a Cubs fan is to know true suffering. And in 2016, they were having the best season they'd ever had, basically. And we all know that that was the, the season where they eventually won the World Series for the first time in like centuries. But anyway, this guy on ESPN. I was, I happened to be, I was lifting weights in the basement. I happened to have that on. I was watching him do this little editorial. And he said something that I kind of alluded to earlier. He said, you know, you you Cubs fans, I keep hearing about waiting for an injury to happen or waiting for some awful bit of fate to intervene. Why double down on pain? Why live through it twice, right? Why go through the pain now of anticipating the pain 
when it could also happen later in the new field again. Why not now? Because he he said this, and it's just it shows how foolish I am and how slow a learner I am. But he said this, and it was like this this lightning bolt from the sky. He said because what if they win? What if they win? How would that feel? How amazing would you then feel if they were to actually succeed? And I, I, I listened to that and I just kind of, you know, stared at the TV and felt the room around me drain away because that started to apply to everything. I started to apply that to my writing. Now, wait a minute. What if this editor says yes? What if this review source likes my book, right? What if this book sells well? And yeah, it's not like I anticipate success all the time, but now I start to allow myself to go there more often, right? To daydream a little bit, to, to think, okay, so what if this does succeed? What if this does do well? And then, you know what? If it doesn't, I'm going to be disappointed anyway. No matter what, I'll be disappointed if it doesn't. But it's so much more pleasurable to imagine things going well than to imagine all the ways that they could crash. So as strange as it sounds, the combination of Ketchum and that little ESPN editorial <laughs> really helped me. Yeah, and that, why double down on pain? I mean, that's the kind of thing you want to print out, you want to put it on your corkboard or wherever so you can see it every day. But, I mean, that's kind of similar in a sense to how I try to live my life. So I sometimes would say that I'm a cynical optimist in the sense that <laughs> I prepare for the worst, but I hope for the best. And yes. I do this in all facets of life. So, I mean, even when we were leaving Japan in terms of becoming a parent, in terms of jobs, in terms of writing, in terms of what I'm doing with This Is Horror. So, I imagine what is the worst case scenario? And, you know, I ask myself, okay, what is realistically the worst that can happen and actually normally it's not as bad as you might think it would be and then it's like well okay if that happens what will I do well now I've got a plan I've prepared for the worst but right. I'm optimistic in terms of my mindset and I'm hoping for the best I have a belief that you know the best could happen it is conceivable and then not only am I hoping for the best, I'm aligning my actions with that, you know, because I need to then act as if I'm going to achieve the best and I need to do the things that will help me, that will strengthen me to be in that best possible position. And then if yes. you aim for that, let's say you aim for what you've decided is the best. Well, if you fall short and then you hit, let's say, 80% of that, that's still going to be a pretty desirable outcome. <laughs> Very much so. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. yeah, there wasn't a question linked with that. <laughs> that was just, no, no, <laughs> that's no, how I no, do no. things. <laughs> no, I think you're exactly <laughs> right. I think it's a very healthy approach. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think that's, you know, not only healthier in the end result, it's healthier in the process, which is where most of our life is lived. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. In a way, like, I'm I'm surprised that it took you so long, you know, this conversation with Dallas for you to change your approach to life only because I can tell from speaking with you and you can see, of course, online and your online persona, just how positive you are and just how much you don't let fear get in the way. Well, well, that's very kind of you. I appreciate it. I the thing is, just to to be honest, I I uh, I've always tried to treat others well, and I think I do for the most part succeed in that. But you know, I'm this this. I, I feel like we live in this world where nobody. We're, we live in the matrix. Basically, the world that we see on social media is not the world. Right. Because people always present themselves as positively as possible. You know, you take five pictures of yourself to put on Instagram. You're going to put the one you're not going to put the one where your eyes are half shut and you're drooling. You're going to put the one where you look good. Right. And, and because of that, I think that the, the lie that we sometimes glean 
is that everybody has a perfect life and I don't, right? Or everybody is confident and I'm not. Everybody else is together and I'm broken. And I think that it's, I think a big part of my growth was finally accepting and acknowledging all my flaws and realizing that, yeah, I'm broken, but I'm no more broken than anybody else because I started to realize that other people had insecurities and fears too. And that made me A, more empathetic toward other people, um, but B, it made me feel better about myself. And it's, it's and so, so the things I'm saying to you, I might not have said five, six, seven years ago, I might not have admitted to being afraid because I didn't want others to judge me negatively. I didn't want to seem weak, right? There are all these, I think especially, you know, I th first of all, I think women are, are, are mistreated far more than men are. All right. But I do think that, you know, all people, there, there are negative things that we have to cope with. One thing that I think that men kind of have to cope with is this, this wrong idea that being a man means never showing any kind of emotion. It means you're stoic all the time. It means that you, that you have to appear tough all the time. And, you know, what really is strength? And I think that strength is, is in vulnerability right? It's easier to feel or to portray toughness and this unfeeling callousness all the time, because then you're not open to any kind of pain. You're not open to any kind of derision. But I think true strength is when you admit that, yeah, I am afraid of this, or yeah, I am broken or, or, or lacking in this way, because then, then you, you know, you're making yourself vulnerable you're showing that you're not perfect. And I think it takes a stronger person to do that than it does the person who, you know, like a lot of men do, oh, well, you know, I'm tough all the time and I'm never going to shed a tear. And if you shed a tear, you ain't no man, right? Um, so anyway, it's like all this stuff is finally, I, I think, I think it, it's divesting ourselves of the lies that we were told our whole lives, the lives that society, the lies that society tells us. And I guess it's just been this slow revelatory process over the last five or 10 years that, that I've undergone. Oh, I'm relating to so much of that. And I think mm -hmm. a game changer for me was becoming comfortable with acknowledging that I can be wrong. And also saying sorry. So saying I'm wrong and saying I'm sorry were two yeah. game changers for me because I think for whatever reason, I, in my up until and in my early 20s, I think I just felt like it was almost better to act like you're right and to be stubborn and to have conviction in your views and what you've done than to just put your hands up and say, you know what? I screwed up. I was wrong. <laughs> and yeah, this can create a really bizarre situation because if you're being that stubborn, you can then argue for your point even to the point of absurdity. It's like it doesn't make any sense. You're clearly wrong and yet you won't admit you're wrong and you won't say sorry. Whereas actually now it's like, well, to say that you're sorry, to say that you're wrong, that takes more strength than to argue for a point that is clearly not right. And also, I mean, it, it shows that you're actually listening to other viewpoints and you're listening to other people if someone can change your mind. But now it's like, you know, I change my mind all the time. What I'm <laughs> saying in this podcast, maybe there'll be some views that I'll have that are slightly different in a year's time, maybe even in a month's time. I guess what, what you're saying on masculinity, that's everything that we could put under this umbrella of toxic masculinity, these bizarre yeah. notions as to what it is to be a man. And yes. I mean, that, that is something that we could do a whole couple of podcasts on, but I think <laughs> no, definitely. It, it probably comes back to being your authentic self and doing that beyond everything else. Look, if you can be yourself and you can ensure that in doing so you are not harming others, then you're probably going to live a pretty good life. I think that's always the caveat. Make sure you're not harming others. If, yeah. if being yourself involves 
pain <laughs> towards others. Okay, now now we've got a problem. Now we have to rethink <laughs> things. But in terms of of anything, in terms of uh, your actions, in terms of your religion, in terms of your lifestyle, whatever it is, if it makes you happy and you're not harming other people, go for it. Yes, I, I exactly. totally, totally agree. Yes. Yeah, the things that I admire in people are not, you know, physical strength or, or you know, or or any type of, of, of show of strength as far as I'm not going to let my emotions show or things like that. The things that I admire are passion, vulnerability, the ability that, to have principles that you adhere to, you know, and people when they talk about who's who's out of, out of everyone that you've ever heard of in life, who would you say would be a hero? You know, you have you have your list of people, and one person who's at the top of my list is probably the most unlikely person that anyone would ever have, and that's Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler Magazine. <laughs> okay, we're talking yeah. about a guy who is who is perverted, who is vile, who but also believed in his principles so much that he was willing to go to prison. <laughs> For a long time, because he was right about something. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's, you can't beat that kind of strength. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you know what? If you want to prove me wrong, that's fine. I know I'm right, and I'll go to jail for the rest of my life for it. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, and it, the crazy thing is, is he took it as far as he could, and he won. Because he was right. And when you see that, and you see that kind of dedication... Over just the fact that, hey, yeah, you know what? If I want to pick on someone, then I have the right to do it. And I, it may not be right, but I have the right to do that. And, you know, people talk about, you know, well, we have this freedom of speech and things like that, and they don't really know how it applies. And you got to kind of give Larry a big, hint, you know, round of applause because he knew exactly how it applied, you know? Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it, it's, it, to me, that's, that's more strength than anything else. You know, then somebody out there who's, you know, who's tough and can beat up people. Those are the people that scare me, the ones that don't talk, that don't have any passion, that have this locked look on their face. You know what I'm talking about? This locked look. You're never going to get past it, you know, mm -hmm. and it's and it's it's men. It's usually and, they're, and these type of people are toxic. And those are the people that I steer clear of because they're not people that I want to associate with. There are people that are going to snap at just a, the wrong statement and they're going to exact physical harm on someone. And that's just not, you know, to me, that's not a sign of strength. That's a sign of instability. Oh, absolutely. Weakness, instability. You know, absolutely. That, those are the kind mm -hmm. of people the world. Uh, they, they diminish the world rather than adding to it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, somebody else, we're t you know, we've talked about Lansdale. We've talked about Ketchum. Somebody, I don't know how you all feel about him, but somebody that I admire in the writing community, and he's a, a great friend, like a brother to me, and somebody who is inspiring and passionate is Brian Keene. Mm -hmm. um, I, knew, I, I knew it was going to be him. I, know. I knew yeah, it was no, going to be him. But, but it's, you know, it's funny. It's like, yeah, on, on one hand, he's a friend and a peer, but on the other hand, he'll always be a hero. Um, from a from a writing standpoint, I love his work, and I'll, I'll, I'll always be starstruck by you know the guy who wrote Ghoul and Dark Hollow. But at the, the same time, you know I, I love how he conducts himself, and people only see him like when there's a controversy, he'll be there. But it's he, but but the reason he's there is because he's passionate, and he's usually you know either calling out somebody for for being unkind to somebody else or he's defending somebody who's being mistreated, right? And so for, for me, like Brian is not out to prove his toughness. He's showing, you know, strength by being passionate about what he believes. And I think that that's a really important distinction, um, but it's one that he nails and one that I really admire. Yes, right. and when, uh, another point is, is that, you know, he is also, he's vulnerable. Whenever he, if, in, 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 when I say that, if he's wrong about something, he will be the first one to tell you he was wrong about something. <laughs> very true, you, very true. You know, and it's like, hey, you know what, And because I listen to his podcast, and he's like, hey, you know what, And uh, I've made a mistake, and this this is really what's going on, and I'm sorry I made this mistake. Whereas other people would be like, well, I'm just going to sweep that underneath the rug. You know, and I said it before, I'll say it again. He is truly the hero that horror needs. He really is. He's, he's horror's Batman. 
And uh, yes, there, yes, there, he is. And there's this cheesy word that I, that I got in one of my one of my classes at Purdue, but it's intentionality. Um, and I think that intentionality, you know, often really matters. And it's, you know, fr from where is this person coming? And Brian, just like just like you two, just like me, we all make mistakes. We're human. We make mistakes. But if you really are, spend time with him, you listen to his podcast, you, you talk to him, you see that his intentionality, the place from which he's coming is a place of good faith, is a place of trying to do the right thing. And, and he, he bends over backward trying to be fair. Even if somebody is a, an abominable human being, he will approach that somebody with as much fairness as he can to present the facts. And, then, and that's what always amazes me when somebody will, you know, will, will pile on him or attack him you know, for this or that. And I'm not saying that, 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 that he should be, I, I guess, you know, above, above dissection like the rest of us. But at the same time, it's like if you really hear what he says and how he says it, he's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to bring justice to the situation. And he's being fair as, as he possibly can, right? Which, I, again, I love about him. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and, you know, he's, he's brutally honest. And that's even about himself. You know, if, if someone has called him out on something and, and I've heard people do that on the podcast that he does and he and he will go through every step. OK, you know what? You were right about that. This is exactly what happened. Here's how it happened. Here's why it happened. Yeah. And for someone to be that. So what, what I call self-reflective mm -hmm. that to me, that's that's a human. That's a, that's a strong human being. And it's strength in being able to to point out your faults, and, yes. and because not everything is all roses, not everything is you know is is beautiful and nice. There are some ugliness, and you have to be able to confront that stuff, and you have to be honest with yourself about how that ugliness may have affected other people. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and you know, I'll tell you, he's gonna be he's gonna be at Killer Con, and I really hope I get a chance to meet him because. <clears throat> mainly because I had a bunch of his books I lost in Hurricane Rita, and he's going to have his books there. So I'm going to be like, hey, dude, I'm buying this one, I'm buying this one, I'm buying this one, because I used to have it. Now you're going to sign them, and I'm going to put them somewhere where they'll never get damaged again. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, he, yeah, uh, he, I, I, gosh, Killer Con is going to be amazing. Rath James White has done an amazing job getting that set up. And right. uh, I'd love to go this year. I, I'm almost certainly going to go next year if, I, if I'm allowed to. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, you, you, he will not disappoint you. And what you're talking about is like he is, he, I, I love the fact that he's secure enough to admit that he has imperfections, right? I think the, uh -huh. the, the, cool, the coolest people can do that. And he certainly qualifies. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I think intentionality is so key. And particularly if we're talking about kind of moral dilemmas or actions and we're saying, is this right or wrong? And, you know, the world is so nuanced and complicated and not black and white that I think really intentionality is something that you need to know because without intentionality you don't really have like a fair or a clear picture and i think with good intentions there's a lot that you can forgive but with bad intentions or if you just did something to be an asshole well that's kind of harder to forgive <laughs> absolutely I, I could not agree more mm -hmm. now i wanted to take things back to when you were 18 because it's my understanding that you decided at 18 that you wanted to be a writer and this was after a terrible car accident so i'd love it if you could talk us through that and tell us a little bit about what happened and where your mind was at yeah so i, I hadn't so it, it was when i was 14 i'd never read a book and I picked up a Stephen King book on a whim and read it, and, and my life was changed. And I, I read as much as I could read from him from 14 to 18, but like you're talking about, um, so maybe the little seeds were, were somewhere in my mind about wanting to write, but I hadn't written until I was 18. When I was 18, I was there was this charity event that I was supposed to participate in, and I was running late, and I was in my car, 
and there was a two-way stop with this with this road that uh, went through, and people often went really fast on that road. And I turned right onto the road. There was a car coming from my left, right, left to right. And there were two vans, but I didn't see the second van. I just saw the first van. So, and they were both going about 70. And it wasn't their fault, even though they're going above the speed limit. It was my fault because I wasn't cautious enough. And so the first van whizzes by. I think that it's clear. I pull out and it just crashes into me driver's side. The second van does. And um, the the pictures from the car, it really is, you know, I know that people kind of ro roll their eyes when they hear the word miracle, but I, I really think it was miraculous that I lived. And, and thankfully, the other driver was not hurt, didn't even have a scratch, um, but I was almost killed and ended up in the hospital and was out, was, was, was unconscious for a good while. And I actually lost about a month of my life. I had amnesia and I still do. I, I, I can't remember anything of that month. It was my senior year in high school. And basically I, I was so severely injured that I couldn't do anything except lie in bed on painkillers and read. And I knew I was going to be out of school for a while. And I had this computer teacher named Dave Brakebill, was his, is his name, at uh, Twin Lakes High School, back where I went to high school in Monticello, Indiana. And Dave was always this great guy to me. And he, 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 by the way, a few years earlier, when I had moved to that school system, I was new. And he was like one of my only friends. Teachers can make such a difference in your life. And uh, I, I, I've thanked him, but maybe not enough because he was a friend to me. He was so nice to me. So anyway, when I was um, you know, in bed, he brought this old Mac computer. He's a computer guy at our school and brought this old Mac with a monitor and everything and set it up by my bedside. And so I started to write, you know, you can, I love reading Stephen King, but, but, you know, after about 14 hours of it, <laughs> you're ready for, for something else. Right. So I was, I, I wanted to change the pace. So I decided to, to write a little bit. I'd had some story ideas and I started to write it and it was awful. It was absolutely putrid stuff. In fact, everything I wrote up until probably the age of like 33 or 34 was just putrid. Um, but anyway, I, I wrote something. And then after I got back to school, I kept going to the writing lab uh, at our school. Um, this teacher named Mrs. Lyons, she would open it every day and I'd sit there and write until about 4.30 or 5 and then I'd have to be kicked out. And again, it wasn't good at all. It was so just, just awful, but I really enjoyed it. I really was fulfilled in a way that I hadn't been before. I was expressing myself, and I, I, I really believe this. This sounds like I'm just being like, you know, uh, too whatever, zen or too positive or unicorns and rainbows. But I really do believe that the moment we put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, we're succeeding. Because that expression, I think, the act of writing makes us emotionally healthier. Because we're starting to get things out. We're starting to put things on the page and express ourselves. And, and it's like, I don't often, most of the time, I don't even know that something is bothering me until I have already written it. And then I look back, I'm like, wow, oh, I'm unburdened. I feel better, right? And it's, and it's not just those things, of course. It's these plots, these plots, these ideas, these, these concepts, these visions, they just haunt me, right? Um, this like tableau I'll see or this character I'll have in mind or this situation. It'll just absolutely haunt me until I get it out on the page. And I think that it's a great way of, of getting rid of those ghosts and, and then putting them in other people's heads, <laughs> which sounds very selfish. But it's also great about working out our insecurities and our fears and our anger, right? Whatever bothers us, that goes out on the page. So I experienced that at age 18. And it really wasn't until I was 26 that I wrote again. Um, and then again, it was awful. Um, back then you talked about the literary writing. I was, it was this awful mishmash of like these different, really di di divergent sources and authors. It was just awful. I, w there was nothing in there unique. It was all just copying these different, and it was <laughs> just, just this horrible stew of different authors from different eras. It was so embarrassing to look back on, but I think that's part of the that's part of your writerly walk, right? We start out by imitating what we've read and looking back. That's healthy. That was good. 
right? But but then after that, I finally, they say after a million words, you find your own voice. For me, it was about two million words that I found my own voice. And that was when I was probably, I'm, I'm 44 right now. That was when I was in my late 30s that I, I started to find my voice. I was about 38, 39. Um, and now I feel like I have my own voice where the influences come out, but in a healthy way, right? Not in a trying to be like this other writer way. Right. It takes a long time to find your own voice. I, I think even Lansdale mentioned uh, yesterday that he, he sold his first piece at 21, but he didn't find his voice, his voice, what he considers his writing voice uh, until his mid thirties. And he had had many, you know, pieces published, you know, prior to that. And he, and he says, he goes, that voice changes. He goes, as you get older, he goes, he goes, I'm still finding it. And I think that's the key is that yes. you, you can't just go, oh, I found my voice, you know, because right. as soon as you do that, you're just like, I lost my voice. I don't know. <laughs> where did it go? Oh, man, I had it. It was right here. <laughs> you know? And it's like you, you right. need to be continuously looking for it because you're not you're never going to be that static person at that point. You, you're going to change. Things are going to change you. You want things to change you. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. And your voice is going to evolve with that. You know, so I mean, in copying other other writers, that's how, that's how you do it. Yep. You know, I would be afraid of any writer who was really really good who's like, I've never read anybody. I just started writing. <laughs> and you're like, and you and you 100% believe them. You're like, okay, there's something wrong with this person. <laughs> Something's not right. You know, it's like you read. Uh, and I'm a big fan of James Elroy, who claims he doesn't read anybody. He blurbs books. I don't know how he does it because he doesn't read anybody else. He's full of shit. He reads other people. He just yep. uses that as part of his persona. You know, I don't need. I don't need to read anybody else. Uh, yeah, you do. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no, just the way it is. Yeah, you said that so well. And then, Michael, you alluded to that earlier as well. In, in the first half of this interview, you talked about how you, you're going to be different in a year than you are now. And I think, Bob, you're exactly right. I think, and that's it. Like, I, I've started to find my voice, but that voice is constantly evolving. I'm most suspicious of people whose minds are made up in every way because essentially what they've done is they've crossed their arms and they've they've they've, they've sat themselves down in a dark room and and that's soundproof and said i'm never going to learn anything ever again right and that is not a healthy way to be so i i it's funny so with 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 my backlist coming back out here soon from flame tree i've been going back over my books uh, you know, the eight backlist titles that they're going to produce in addition to two new ones. And I, um, it feels like somebody else wrote some of these books, like it in no way. So like House of Skin, that was the second book I had published, but it was the f the first book I ever wrote, the first book I ever completed. And I'm, I'm going back through, and I'm not changing much. Like Brian Keene talked about doing this with The Rising. Like Brian, of all his books, he doesn't love The Rising. That was his that was his debut and all this stuff and he he sees a lot of flaws in it even though it's a classic and and I and you know house of skin I'm not saying it's a classic at all but I'm saying that it was an early book for me my earliest one and as I sit there and, and look at it and I'm just looking for like little word choice errors here and there I, I'm very light edits but it's like so different than I am now it's so just like a different person and and that's good that's a positive thing because I'm glad that I'm writing differently now. Yeah, you can still tell it's my work, I guess, but I like the fact that I'm writing differently and hopefully better now than I did back then. And I think that's that's a step in our, in our evolution. Yeah. Right. You have to be con continuously changing and evolving and, and, and striving, you know, to, to get better. It's just – it, the, the folding the arms and sitting there, that's like uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm – that kind of stuff scares me because it's, it's like you, you've you've made a decision, you know. You're like you're that you're that old man. Get out of my yard, you know. <laughs> and and it's like it just doesn't make any sense. And the pun, you know, the, here's the thing: changes come. You can't stop it, and you might as well. You don't necessarily need to embrace every single one of them, but you need to kind of roll with them. Mm -hmm. Or you're just going to be like going, man. There's just a lot of dust in my eyes. I don't get it, you know. <laughs> Very true. I said a similar thing during our conversation with Craig Davidson, but if I decided, oh, I'm never 
gonna learn anything again or I decided right I've written the best possible story I can write well if that's the case if I'm stagnating if I feel I can't improve why bother writing why not yeah. find something else to do something else to learn so if if I ever get to a point where I feel I cannot improve any further then I think I'd do something else because yeah. if I'm not improving I'm stagnating or worse I'm regressing and I'm not interested in that absolutely right yeah I mean you look at a guy like Ray Bradbury he wrote into his 90s right I have so much admiration, not only for the beauty and poetry with which he left us, but for his dedication to consistent and continuous self-improvement, right? He was always driven, always wanting to, to explore and expand. I love that. What a healthy way to write. What a healthy way to live. So that's one of the reasons why I love Bradbury. Right. But can I mean either of you conceive of the idea of not wanting to write or not wanting to do something where you're improving in some way? I mean, to be honest, if I ever got to that, if I ever thought, you know what, I'm done, then it's like, well, game complete. <laughs> like Life is done. It's like, right, you can you can take me now. But I don't think that's going to be the case because I think we can always learn. There are always things that we can do. There are always things we can improve. And that's why I often say you can be good at anything, but you can't be good at everything. And then you can mm -hmm. apply that and say, you know, I can be good at this at this stage in my life and good at that at another mm-hmm yeah i don't know how bob feels uh for me yeah i i will never ever ever stop i can't stop tom piccarelli uh the late wonderful author i think he and i heard this from from a few different sources but he said something like if he were on a desert island what would he do and i think he said that he would grab a stick and start drawing words in the sand yeah and then i think that describes mm -hmm. Me and probably I don't know about you Bob but probably and I think that that it's that burning urge to, to write to get those ideas out and to explore them and it's just the most amazing feeling and uh, yeah never ever will I stop ever yeah there's I mean when I was growing up I wanted to be you know a rock guitar player so I, I learned how to play guitar and I took uh, every music class I could poss possibly take and probably one of the most enlightening experiences I ever had was I was taking private lessons from a music theorist. And so we spent a lot of time actually at the piano and a little time at the guitar. But we 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 mainly we we learned about, you know, theory, but timing, things like that. And there came there came a day when I'd been with this uh, particular teacher for Golly, I think it was probably maybe a year or two. And he finally said, I'm unable to teach you anything else. And I was I was like, I was broken hearted. I was like, well, why? And he goes, because he goes, you know this. And I said, so what am I supposed to do now? You know, I mean, you're you're supposed to be the best and you don't even want to teach me anymore. <laughs> and he said, and he said, you're taking it the wrong way. He goes, you're always going to learn. There's going to be new things to learn all the time. He goes, what I'm doing is I'm giving you permission to do what you wanted to do all along. You need to create. He goes, and all you need is my permission to do it. So he said, you need to find a band who wants to do original material. And that's what I did. Now, of course, you know, nature has a funny way of playing tricks on you and stuff like that and gave me, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome. So it's like, hey, you still play guitar? I'm like, no, I kind of like holding the fork, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, man, it's like there's, you know, I can still play. I'm not as good as I used to be, maybe because the limitations of what this disease has done to my hands. Uh, I can't play as long, uh, you know, and so it's I, I at that point. But I was also writing lyrics and that's that and I'd written some stories and that's what, sh you know, shifted me into writing. And 
I, I'm like you, man. I'm, I'm always going to be writing. I'm always trying to learn how to do something better. And, you know, I have setback states like that. It's not a gradual slope. It's steps. Some steps are bigger than others. Mm-hmm. I think as far as my writing has going in, in the last year that I've taken a huge step and I'm ready to apply those those principles that, that I've learned. Uh, you know, it's just I got, like I said earlier, you know, just giving myself permission to suck again, <laughs> you know, and just so I can get the, you know, pound out the words. And you just got to continuously move on. I mean, it's just it's it never ends. What a what a cool teacher, by the way. What an awesome teacher to have the humility to be able to say that and to try to give mm-hmm. you or help you realize your own wings so then you can do it, right? So the right. teacher had the the, the humility uh, to, to, to admit that now, okay, this next step you got to do on your own. And that had to, I mean, maybe scary, but also empowering to you. Uh, which is what teachers are supposed to do, right? They're not puppeteers. They're supposed mm-hmm. to help you, you know, find your own voice so then you can take the next steps. Right. And it was, you know, it was, <clears throat> I don't know, it, it was scary because I, I didn't have the, uh, I, I didn't know anybody in a band. So, my, but my parents did because they, they, they knew people that had kids that were in bands. And so they, you know, they put me with them. And, and I continued to learn. It was amazing because I was, you know, was surrounded by, especially, the, you know, the older guitar players who would show me things that, that, that you can't learn in a classroom, you know. And so, and then, but at the same time, they were like, hey, you know, they would, if we were playing a song, and especially if we were doing a cover song and they wanted me to, you know, to take a solo, I'd get that nod. And it's like it's it's like you're stepping on a tightrope, you know, to it's like go ahead and take this solo, you know, and it, and I'd butcher it, but then they'd be like, hey man, this is pretty good, you know, but you, know, you might want to listen to it again because there's a couple little breaks you missed, you know, and so and then on original songs, it's like that was the deal, it was cruel, and I can't even explain it, and it's <laughs> like when you write, you, you know what I'm talking about though, because man, when you write, especially like if you write like a short story, because that's, that's kind of like writing a song, and you and you just and you nail the ending, you nail everything about it. It's a feeling that it's a high that you can't get, man. Right. I mean, you can't you can't bottle it. And if you could, uh, you'd be a multi trillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yes. We've got a number of questions from our patrons. So I thought if we could start with one from Kev Harrison. And I guess I should say that obviously because we've had such a far-ranging conversation, some of these questions we have partially covered. Mm -hmm. But here's the first one. So Kev says, I know from your newsletter and social media feed that there have been difficult periods and events in your writing journey to date, publishers going bump, etc. How do you stay positive in those difficult times? Mm, yeah, man, that's just, you know, there's this, uh, I, 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 there, there's this prayer, you know, and regardless of your, you know, spirituality, lack of spirituality, I think it's a good, a good thing to keep in mind. And it's, the prayer goes something like, uh, give me the strength to change what I can to accept what I cannot and to have the wisdom to know the difference between the two. And, you know, I think that's not just a prayer. I think that that's for anybody. That's a good, you know, a fairly good guide for life because, you know, so many things are out of our control and we want control, but control is often an illusion. We can only control our own approaches, right? We can control to a degree our actions and words, but we can't control market forces. We can't control what this publisher or this editor does. And yeah, so the, the, the publisher that broke me in, uh, Sam Hain, it back in 2011, 2012, it went under and took nine of my books with it. And that was, and so they went out of print. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, most of my output is just gone into the ether. And that wasn't really fun. It was, it was, first of all, surprising. And then there was this sense of just kind of being adrift. And 
and but but you know the more you the more I look back on it the more I realize and I don't wish ill on anybody and I'm not going to sit here and bash anybody because there are a lot of nice people that work for that company and they were really nice to me and and looking back I just feel bad for them that the company went under because they deserved for it to not to they they deserve for it to to go better than it did but regardless it went under and then these you know books were gone for a while and I did have uncertainty and worry and fear and, you know, because there, there was a time when for a long, when I only had like one book for sale on, on like Amazon and that, that's a weird feeling to go from having like 10 to one. And, and, and I'm talking a substantial length of time for like a year and a half, like children of the dark was about the only book available for a long time of mine. Now, in my opinion, that's it was a good one, so that was good, but you'd like to have your other works available. So I, I guess what I tried to do was just to remind myself that, okay, so this this is, you can't change your circumstances, you can just change how you react to them. So you can either be despondent and feel sorry for yourself, or you can work doubly hard and be prepared for change when it comes, and that's what I did. I, the, the, I wrote about this somewhere, I forget where, I think it was in one of my newsletters actually, that, that Kev is alluding to, but in Bag of Bones, Stephen King's wonderful ghost story, Mike Noonan, the author, writes like five books that he just, over the, over time, that he stores away in this lockbox. And they're like rainy day books in case, in case he ever dies and his family needs supported, in case he ever has writer block or writer's block or whatever, but he has these five books. And I felt almost like I, I was doing that during that period where only one of my books was available. I was writing more than ever and still am. And so I have this backlog of books, not only the backlist ones that are coming, but books that are unpublished, either spoken for by publishers or books that I'm yet to place and I haven't even submitted to publishers yet. But I've got this big backlog that's there. And it's really exciting because it's some of the best work I've ever done. But nobody except for like two or three pre-readers has ever read them before, right? So that's how I reacted to, to that particular adversity. That's probably the one to that, that, that piece of adversity, I think is, is probably the central one to which he was alluding. But the way I reacted was by writing and working harder than ever. And, and, and now I think in, in 2000, late 2018, 2019, 2020, I think we're gonna see that you know, it's gonna bear fruit because I did work really, really hard and tried to evolve all the more. Um, in those difficult circumstances. Yeah, and I think it's often said that, you know, the way we act during these testing times, this is what shapes us, this is what shows our true character. I mean, it's yeah. easy for anyone to be happy and to be positive while things are going well, but when you have something like that happen, I mean, goodness, nine of your books are going out of print. Oh, those are the times that will test you for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, the other thing too, and I don't want to make myself sound like a martyr here because there's so many authors who go through so much worse than that. Um, you know, Victor Laval, I was reading a, 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 a wonderful writer. I was reading one of yeah. his tweets. They were talking about rejections, like people were sharing their rejections and, um, uh, you know, basically he was rejected because this one time by a publisher, because this publisher already had, and, and this is the publisher's words basically to Victor, we already have a minority writer. So sorry, we can't publish your work. And then it's like, oh my gosh, are you serious that, that somebody would actually not only say that, but think that and, and then behave that way, that, that, that this person believed that because he or she already had a writer of, of that particular race, you know, on the roster, that all doors were shut to other writers that just happened to be of that race. I mean, that's, you know, so, so there are writers who deal with that, right? There yeah. are writers who, who because, of, because of their gender, right, are marginalized. You know, we, it's, it's like, we like to, I think societally, we like to see ourselves as so advanced. You know, we're not, we have so, yeah, maybe we're better than we were 200 years ago, but look how awful it was 200 years ago. Right. So it's not time for self congratulatory back padding. You know, it's time for more vigilance to change because, you know, there, there's still, there's this idea in our field, we still need to have so many more women published 
than we do now, right? And, and, and so many more opportunities. So, you know, the things that I've been through are, are, are yeah, they were frustrating, but man, they, they, are, they pale in comparison to some of the stuff that other writers have to go through. Right. And I'd, I'd seen that tweet, but I didn't realize it was Victor Lavelle. I mean, the yeah. only good thing about that tweet, the only good thing about that rejection is the publisher is basically holding up a red flag for everyone to see and to yeah. avoid that publisher at all costs. But what a yeah. mind-numbingly stupid thing to say. What a stupid thing to think. And right. I mean, probably beside the point but they're missing out on one hell of a writer and they're missing <laughs> out on so many talented writers i mean goodness on this is horror we're always encouraging people to read widely and i mean that's what makes things interesting that's what makes life interesting talking with and reading and experiencing things from other cultures so yeah. What what a bizarre attitude and one that's certainly not akin to the way I would view the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like they they are mis yeah, a, a they don't deserve him, right? They didn't deserve him. So I'm glad they didn't publish him. And then B, I mean I'm not glad of their reasons, but I'm glad that you know that, that they deserve to miss out. You know, they're not worth the dust on his shoes. Um so yeah, it's just, you know, it's 2018. But sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> An unfortunately true comment. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to segue from there, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is sobering. It makes... Yeah. It is. Well, Kev Harrison has a second question. And he sure. says... One thing that really impressed me with your work has been the ability to write really quite gruesome, hard violence and also the more atmospheric, pensive, even emotional scenes with equal conviction. Mm. Do you have any techniques for flipping from one to the other or is there a time of day, mental state, or what have you that fits one better than the other? That's what a great question. Uh, well, Kev's nail on it. <laughs> yeah. That, so, yeah, I think that that's partially reflective, largely reflective of my reading. The, the, the two most important pieces of, of writing advice I've ever heard are to read, read, read and write, write, write. But but you notice that I I said read first, and you two would probably agree. And, and yeah, Bob, you talked about that. Well, I think you were talking about that with James Elroy. I don't believe him either. First of all, riot, writers are liars. So I completely believe he's lying there if he says he's not reading. And Stephen King talks about it. He says, if you don't have time to read, you don't have time to write. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that my reading has been very diverse across genres. And then even within horror, horror is such a beautifully diverse genre and i'm not just talking about the different writers but i'm not I'm, I'm talking about the different styles and modes of horror and so you know i've read a lot of quiet horror i've read a lot of charles l grant and others in that in that vein um but at the same time i've i've read plenty of richard layman and other extreme horror and so when i go to write a book you know, I think all those influences, they become part of you, just like the people you meet, they become part of you. So my, my, my mother, my grandfather, they live in me and hopefully live in my actions. So too um, do my influences get expressed and, and it's never a conscious decision. It's never like, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to channel Richard Matheson here, right? Or I'm going to channel Shirley Jackson, but it, it comes out. It's very organic. And that's, that's the great thing about reading is that you're absorbing it. And then, you know, Stephen King calls this the boys in the basement, I think, you know, or, or, or you know, the, the girls or women or men or whatever you want to call in the basement, those things become part of your instrument. Um, they become part of your unique instrument and then, and then they come out on the page. And so it's very natural for me. Siren and the Spectre is a great example of my upcoming release from Flame 
century, September 6th. Sorry to sound like a huckster there, but it just felt kind of rolled off my tongue. But but when that when I wrote that book, there are a lot of scenes of very kind of quiet, uh, brooding horror where dread is the emotion I'm trying to elicit. Um, and then there are other scenes, you know, particularly later in the book, where I think there's some good action. But all of those scenes just developed very, very naturally, very unforced. And it's just because I've read so widely. So I think that that is, you know, I've, I've had bad advice, but I've also had good advice. And that's one of the best pieces of, advice, pieces of advice I've ever heard is to read widely in and out of the genre. And I think that helps make your instrument a lot more interesting. And The Siren and the Spectre, I recently started reading it and... I mean, instantly hooked, and for me, I thought it was like the kind of old-school horror of Richard Matheson and early Stephen mm -hmm. King, and mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and we sometimes, sometimes the term page-turner is a little bit overused, but I think it absolutely fits in this instance, and yeah, I mean, you've got You've got scenes where you're kind of more fearful of the house, of a supernatural entity. And then you've got other scenes, which again, a little bit more Ketchum-esque, and you're worried about some of the human beings. And, I, you know, for me, I love, I love that juxtaposition within horror when it's like, oh, seems like the house is haunted. Oh shit, it seems like the people around the house are even worse. <laughs> I'm staying in the fucking house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that is so awesome for you to say and for me to hear. I really appreciate it. Um and you use a beautiful word there, juxtaposition. I was just using that same word in my in my film class on Friday. Juxtaposition is is one of the primary tools of the filmmaker in, in editing and in shot choice in, in, in scene tone, you know, the tonal differences between scenes. And I think that it is just as much uh, the case in fiction writing. I love the power of juxtaposition because this scene of more visceral horror lends more interest to this scene of quiet foreboding, right? And vice versa. So when you juxtapose those extremely uh, varied um, poles, I think that they really accentuate and lend power to each other. So so personally, and, and, and that doesn't have to be the case with every writer. Some writers, like you get into this groove, like um, Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. That story is, is like it's in a vibe, it's in a groove, and it kind of follows that all the way through. It's like the slow descent into hell. And, and, and it's perfect, right? And it doesn't have to be one thing and then another thing and then 10 different influences. Is it kind of is a thing. It's it's the unity of effect that Poe was so expert at, at unfolding. But I feel like, you know, with, with a novel especially, I think that it's really interesting to have the juxtaposition of different tones. If this scene is one way, I want this scene to be that way. I want them to be different. And, and, and it's very, I, I, it's not calculated because it's all kind of with your gut, but you kind of, the more you read that sort of stuff, the more you watch, you know, different types of movies because i'm i'm just as apt to watch a romantic comedy or a musical as i am to watch a martial arts film or a horror movie but i feel like watching variety and, and reading variety i think that that juxtaposition and variety becomes very very natural right and, and and it makes everything all the better right you can learn a lot from going outside of the genre especially especially like in movies like i've learned a lot about writing horror from watching comedy nice. movies and and what you're talking about juxtaposition you know one one example modern example i'd say modern uh you know probably with the last you know 20 years is there's a scene at the beginning of there's something about mary where ben stiller <laughs> is talking about he's talking about how he actually you know met mary you know the the prettiest girl in the school and how all this stuff happened and, uh, you know, and talking about how they were going to have, you know, he was taking her to the prom, you know, and it was like a flashback, a little mini flashback scene before the really, really funny stuff starts. And you can tell this movie is going to go in that direction because it cuts. And there, there's one of his, his, 
antagonistic buddies going, you're a liar. You are not taking her to the prom, you know? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I really am. You know, and it's, and it's just it, it, that, that kind of scene, you see that. And if you try, if you, if you know how it works and it's like, Hey, this is, this kind of sets the tone of where we're going with this. It's funny in the sense that it's just, it comes out just out of left field, you know? And if you can use that type of scenery in, in a horror film, to to vary your scenes and things like that, it's going to make your scenes have more impact, yes. you know. Yes. And that's you know, so yeah, you can learn a lot from watching uh, comedy movies. You know, it's uh, especially to, to horror because you want to you want to have that kind of tension relief. You you, you might not necessarily want to use something that's funny, but you want to break that tension. You want to vary it. And that's going to allow you to bring up that that next hill that you got to climb, and you got to reach even a higher peak, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's so well said. And I think that what we're talking about in horror, you know, really that holds true. Each genre is a universe, and then there are universes within the, within the universes. You know, in, in just that the juxtaposition of those scenes before the flashback, I think he's talking. Ben Stiller is talking to Richard Jenkins. I think he plays the 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 the, psych, the psychologist or psychiatrist in that scene. Right, and and that is equally funny because Jenkins keeps saying these things with a completely straight face that are sort of alarming to Ben Stiller, right? Right. Because you have that subtler humor that's juxtaposed with the shock of him zipping up his junk, right? <laughs> yeah. So so both of those make the other one funnier and funnier because they are such different types of humor. And, and I love that about I love that about comedy. I love that. And that's why I always just roll my eyes when people are dismissive of any type of film or book, right? right. Oh well, well, well comedies are just frivolous or, or, or action is just mindless explosions. And you know, within all these worlds or universes, there's so much there if you look. Right. If you give it a chance and look, you can find great examples of art in any genre, written or screened or filmed. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That and whole scene with Jenkins is just a a, 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 a scene. It's a mastercraft scene in Southerly, you know, because you got Ben Stiller on the couch. He's away from the door. Jenkins <laughs> isn't even in the room. <laughs> he's in the back eating because Stiller's just been going on and on and on. And he comes back and he's like, you know. And Jenkins is just such a good actor. You know, yeah. he just sits down. He realizes he still has his uh, his little bib on. You know, and he's like, "Oh wait, let me put this up." You know, yeah, and, then, and then he leaves him on a low. You know, we'll dive into that on our next session. It's like you don't <laughs> you don't do that as a psychiatrist. There's so much craziness in that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> totally, that's a comedy classic. I love that movie. When you're talking about action and comedy and horror and people who are dismissive and say, oh, it's just this or it's just that. I mean, firstly, I'm pretty, I find it pretty difficult to trust people who dismiss an entire genre. And yeah. I think it's reasonable enough in music, in art, in films, in literature to have preferences. But sure. to say, I hate this genre, or to say this genre has no artistic value, or this is derivative, you know, it, it's just not true. And as you say, right. look harder. And yeah, okay, maybe if you were to look at the worst of the genre, yeah, there might not be too much of value. But if you take the very best examples, as you say, look close, look at what's going on. It's more than an action film. It's more than a yes. comedy. I mean, and with music, there are certain genres that I don't particularly gravitate towards, for example, R&B or country. But if someone says, look, this is the best R&B track, of course, I'm going to listen to it. Hell, I'll right. even listen to the best R&B album. That's going to take more of my time. But if you're telling me that is the <laughs> best one, I'll do it. And I think it's the same with films. I mean, my preference is typically horror and crime and dark thriller. But, you know, if it's like these are some of the best period dramas, these are some of the best romantic movies, hell yeah, I'm going to watch them. 
Yes, exactly. You know, the, 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 the one, one genre uh, that people, I think, I mean, people dismiss horror quite a bit. I'll stay away from that for a moment just because we all love horror. I'm kind of preaching to the converted here. But with uh, musicals, I hear people say sometimes, well, you know, well, I, I don't like musicals because in real life, people don't break into song and dance. So that doesn't happen in real life. And my response is always twofold. Like, one, A, you haven't been around my family very much because, <laughs> because we, we dance even though I'm awful at it all the time and we sing all the time. And then B... You know, well, in real life, I can't remember the last time I journeyed to Mount Doom to, to, to destroy the Ring of Power. I can't remember the last time that I did battle with a 26-foot great white shark. I don't remember ever having a trench run toward the Death Star. So since those things didn't happen in real life, they must be ridiculous and ludicrous and, and, and able to be dismissed as well, right? If we're going to use that, as that, if that's your litmus test that doesn't happen in real life, then go ahead and just stop watching movies. Stop yeah. reading movies. We watch movies and we read books because they are more interesting than real life, right? That's why we go to them. Uh, and, you know, I watch a movie like, you know, La La Land, and not everybody loved that. That's fine, all right? But I found it to be so just moving and interesting and, and unique, but also, you know, all these callbacks to the movies of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and, and old Hollywood, you know, for me, that works beautifully. So it's fine. And I love what you said. It's, it's You can have taste. You, right, I may, I might dislike something that you like. Totally cool, but but to just dismiss it out of hand, you know, that's that's reductionist, and that is really depriving oneself of of, of a lot of joy and a lot of discovery. Yeah, I, and it's so true. And I love that you know you're saying. Well, in my family, there's a lot of songs and dancing, and to be honest, like that kind of thing happens all the time with me too it's just that you couldn't really <laughs> record it and release it i mean un unless you know the market was like listen to just how badly this guy sings then <laughs> then maybe you know it's gonna sell very well but yeah like i think singing and dancing and creating art and telling stories i mean this is kind of what makes life fun and <laughs> it, it kind of um keeps that kind of magic and that innocence of childhood alive a little bit and yeah you know like i remember when i was a kid like i used to think there was a big division between being a child and being an adult and it's like well there isn't really it's almost like with adulthood we're just kind of acting we're just like pretending that we've got our shit together and that we know more but really <laughs> like we're all dancing and being silly and we're all vulnerable and we all kind of cry the same and have the same amounts of pain i guess maybe the the big differences between childhood and adulthood are you've got innocence and experience which of course william blake did like a whole kind of poetry book on yeah. and yeah. then you've also just got societal expectations and what is deemed as reasonable <laughs> but i think yeah like the kind of line between childhood and adulthood it's a lot more blurred and it's more of a myth than you believe it to be when you're a kid absolutely i think the destruction of that line is part of achieving happiness or moving yeah. closer happiness. I totally agree. That's one of the many lies. We have so many lies humankind tells itself. That's one of the main ones and one of the most damaging ones, I think. Oh, yeah. Man, I feel that we've just taken the podcast to another level. <laughs> <laughs> it went up a notch. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. Join us again next time for the third and final part of our conversation with Jonathan Jans. Of course, if you want to get the conversation ahead of the crowd, all you need to do is become our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And not only do you get early bird access to each and every single episode, but you can submit a question for each and every interviewee. You join an ever-expanding community of like-minded readers and writers. You get to take part in community discussions on writing and on life itself. 
And at $3, you get Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing. It is a podcast in which we dissect and analyze stories and films and let you know not only our insight, but the thoughts of others who have analyzed these texts and they're great conversations. Sometimes it's just me and Bob. Other times we have a guest for the special Jack Ketchum episode. We had Max Booth the Third, and recently we recorded a special story unboxed with Lisa Quigley and Mackenzie Kira of The Ladies of the Fright. That was an episode in which we unboxed The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, and you will be able to hear that very soon for just $3. And as a This Is Horror patron, you are indirectly supporting other creators because every 25 patrons that we get over 100, we support someone else. And recently we hit the 125 patron milestone and we are now supporting Escape Artists Inc. And they are the company that are responsible for Perhaps a number of your favorite short story podcasts, but most notably as horror fans, Pseudopod, a horror fiction podcast that is so fantastic that you great, great readers and listeners voted it fiction podcast of the year. Not just in the most recent This Is Horror Awards, but for two years running. We are also supporting Crystal Lake Publishing, Booked Podcast, and Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. So, a lot of great creators. And we want to support more, so help us get to 150 patrons, and we will do just that. Okay, before I wrap up, let us have a quick word from our wonderful sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash pmmpublishing. Have a scary day. Get ready to indulge in an audio experience that will make your skin crawl and your stomach churn. Sadistic experiments are being carried out in Arlington Asylum, designed to remake our world as a demonic Lovecraftian hellscape. Tormented, from horror author Lee Mountford and narrator Hannibal Hills, is now available as a high-quality audiobook. Search Tormented on Audible or Amazon now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Another way that you can support the This Is Horror podcast completely free is to leave us a review over on iTunes. Now, we haven't had a new iTunes review this week, but we did recently get a very complimentary comment from Kevin Damon over on Patreon in the community tab and yeah I thought I'd share it with you because it's really lit me up and made my day so thank you very much Kevin Damon listen to episodes 213 and 214 the Paul Tremblay interview loved it and I'm really happy that I decided to pledge to this podcast I especially like the casual nature of the interviews. It feels like a genuine conversation, but the topics touch on some pretty intellectual discussion too. Very good balance. Keep up the good work. You've gained a loyal listener. Again, thank you so much, Kevin, and tremendous, really, the you decided to support us when you hadn't even listened to an episode and hey, thank goodness that we didn't disappoint, right? And remember, if you're a patron, you can leave comments over in the community tab as well. It is 
oft neglected, but it is there for you to use, so please do. And if you're a patron, check it and get involved in the conversation, reply to other people's comments. This is what I mean by becoming a community. We're all in it together and, you know, you're great when we put a post up and I ask questions and we have a community discussion, but, you know, I don't have to be the one to start that discussion. You can start a topic, you can comment on a topic that someone else has started, so please do. All right, I would like to conclude the episode with a quote. And today I have a quote from Raymond Carver. Every great or even every very good writer makes the world over according to his own specifications. It's akin to style what I'm talking about, but it isn't style alone. It is the writer's particular and unmistakable signature on everything he writes. It is his world and no other. This is one of the things that distinguishes one writer from another. Not talent. There's plenty of that around. But a writer who has some special way of looking at things and who gives artistic expression to that way of looking, that writer may be around for a time. I'll see you in the next episode for the third and final part of our conversation with Jonathan Jans. But until then, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing and have a great Great day.